thank you for inviting me to the library. I always like to come out and um, talk to uh, people about my passion, which is local history, and the Coconut Grove is one of those things. Now, I'm going to start out by, because I was overhearing somebody tell a story here about how a relative of theirs was going to go to the Coconut Grove that night, but it was so crowded they couldn't get in, or they left early. Okay. Now, I, I think this is, these are very important stories. Now, I have to confess, I've heard that story, or a variation of it, about, I would say, almost 100 times. <laughs> um, and that's not to say they're not all true. I, I think it underlies a greater truth. I mean, the first time I heard it, I thought that was, wow, that was really great. And then second and third, fourth time, I thought, hmm, I don't know, what's going on here? And then I realized that those stories underlie a greater truth about the Coconut Grove fire, that people in, the, in this area, the Boston area, felt it could happen to them, that any one of them could have been a victim of that fire, which made it extremely personal. And that was a sentiment that they handed on to various people. And I think that's in a very important point, and I think something that we keep uh, thinking about when we think about tragedies. Because how can we deal with them? How can we think about them unless it's something that we think can happen to us. Okay. So you heard a little bit of my background, so I'm just going to plunge right in. Um, is there, I wonder if we can lower some of the lights a little bit. Would that be possible? Is that going to ruin your? A little. But just yeah. Is that is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Up. Oh, we need to go up. We've got it. We're we're on television, so Yay. so we have to. Okay. Just a little bit more. Okay. So, um, why? Why do we tell the story over again? Why do we keep telling it? And I'll move around so everyone can see the slides. So let me give you three points of why we need to keep telling the story of something that happened 75 years ago over and over again. Station nightclub fire, ghost ship warehouse fire, the Grenfell Tower fire in London. Look at the death toll. Tragedies like the Coconut Grove, not exactly like it, but very much like it, are still happening. We still haven't learned the lessons. We are still dealing with overcrowded situations. We are still dealing with people who don't follow rules, safety rules, because they say it can't happen here. But it does. So these are the reasons we need to keep repeating the history and the stories of the Coconut Grove over and over again. Um, the other reason which um, I'll go into is that we're, we continue to learn things about it. And I will share with you tonight some of the things I've been learning about it, even just recently. So let's take a look at the Coconut Grove. This gives you an idea of where it is. I'm going to give you some background on the fire. This is something that obviously appeared in the newspaper after, after it. Um, and we'll take a look at it. Now let me start, uh, since I'm a teacher, I need, to ask the I need to ask the class, how many people here are familiar with the Coconut Grove, have heard of it? How many people, is anybody you're hearing about it for the first time? First time, okay. So a lot of you already know kind of the outlines of the story, but we're going to dive in a little bit, and maybe I'll be able to tell you some things that you don't know. So the Coconut Grove was a nightclub in the downtown Boston area. Here's about where it is now, okay? We can take a look. This is Pied there's Piedmont Street, uh, Charles Street, uh, Church Street's on this side, Stewart Street. Um, the Revere Hotel is the biggest hotel nearby. This is uh, what they call a Bay Village. Um, so it's th there's a site there, and I'll talk more about this site at the end of this, at this lecture. So, so do you want the lights on? Well, um, I would like some of them down if we could, just okay. to, to um, is that okay? Is that All right. Good? Okay. All right. Okay. So here's another look, approximately where the club was. Okay. Here's a picture of it after the fire. But you can see, for one thing, that this was in an area with lots of streets, uh, lot, a lot, very crowded. Uh, there were nightclubs all over the place. So this is kind of a nightclub row. The, the Mayfair is over there. The uh, Latin Quarter was not was pretty nearby. So this is an entertainment, actually an entertainment area of Boston at the time. It was right behind the theater district. So um, here's another look at the, at the club after the fire. So how did it get started? Well... The Coconut Grove in the Boston was modeled after the Coconut Grove in Los Angeles. There was a famous uh, nightclub called in the Ambassador Hotel in uh, Los Angeles, and the people who started the, the Coconut Grove in Boston 
uh, they weren't particularly original. They wanted to have something that was successful, so they came up with their own idea of what something called the coconut grove would look like. And the two gentlemen who put that together were a uh, pair. Uh, one was, I'm sorry, this, this thing is cutting us off a little bit here. Um, but this is Jacques Renard, who was well known as a musician at the time, and Mickey Alpert, who was an entertainer and actually a, a furniture salesman. Um, who wanted to go into showbiz. And together, they got together, pooled their money, and bought what used to be a film distribution garage, uh, di film distribution center, and an old garage in that part of Boston I showed you about. And they turned it into a fabulous, swank nightclub with the help of a kind of a mysterious guy who put up all the money, and then they later found he was a mobster, and he fled, and he was wanted by the by the um, authorities, so they had quite a bit of trouble keeping it going. Um, they opened with a huge splash. This is uh, an ad from the beginning of it. And I even have a copy of, this is the menu from the opening. Remember, to see how they called the Bernard Coconut Room. But they had all kinds of fancy meals, um, desserts, drinks, other things like that. So it opened with a huge splash. The unfortunate thing is that it could not sustain itself uh, because of um, some problems. So let me let me show you some interesting pictures of the club itself in the night. This is the 1930s. This is a picture of the outside of the club, and you've probably seen variations of it. But what you might not have seen are pictures like this, or this, <coughs> or this. You might have seen this picture, which gives the idea of a huge main dining room inside. This is a more accurate picture, as well as this. So this was the, the place where people danced. And you can see, it's not very big. And if you can imagine the night of the fire, lots of people were crowned in there. Also, if you look up, you can kind of see some light coming from the ceiling. That was one of the interesting things about the Coconut Grove nightclub the whole ceiling could roll back. So people could dance under the stars. So this was something that was uh, quite a thrill for people who came to the club. So it was the place to see and be seen in Boston. Except for one little thing that was going on at the time that would make running a club very hard to continue financially. Can anybody in the class tell me what that might have been? Prohibition. Prohibition, exactly. People could not drink, at least not officially. And that proved to be a problem. So unfortunately, the, um, the guys in about the 1930s had to sell out to this gentleman right here. And this was a guy named Charles Solomon, otherwise known as King Solomon. And he was, mm, how shall I describe him? A gangster. Uh, and so he was, he was well known. Uh, is running a, a variety of rackets in the in the Boston area, but he was kind of the old style gangster, like a Capone. He would get dressed up in his suits, white suits or tuxedos, go down to the Coconut Grove and greet people coming in. Hi, how you doing? How's it going? How's the steak? You like steak? Don't like steak? Hey, send him, send him a new steak. You know that kind of thing. Um, uh, maybe even Donald Trumpish. I don't know. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Anyway, but he ran the Coconut Grove kind of as his, his own fiefdom. And uh, for him, it was profitable because he was pulling money off the, the top somehow. We don't really know exactly how. One thing he started, one um, uh, in thing he established at the club that would haunt everyone later on was the habit of keeping doors locked. Locked from the inside and locked from the outside. For example, here, what if you couldn't get out? Because you didn't want you running out in your money. You haven't paid your bill, I'm not, you're not going out until you paid your bill. So he started to do that. He was also scared about people sneaking up on him. And actually, he was right to worry about that because one evening, <coughs> he was at this club, which was an after-hours club on... Tremont Street, it was called the Cotton Club, and he was hanging out with his entourage when he was approached by a, a group of men who hustled him to the bathroom, arguments broke out, shots rang out, the men fled, and King Solomon staggered out holding himself where he'd been shot saying, the dirty rats, they got me. And I know that's true because he was in the Boston Herald. <laughs> <laughs> so, exit King Charles. Customers 
or the club could only come in in one place, and that was the main entrance. It was a revolving door. That's the only place they could come in. Um, they could go to this lounge, but only from doors on that side of the building. They couldn't go from this room to that room. They could go from here downstairs and here into the dining area. But there was no access, public access, from there to there, which is kind of interesting, given what happened the night of the fire. Uh, this is a picture from the new lounge, the Broadway Lounge, and that's Tiny Shea, <coughs> who's the bartender. You can see why he got the name Tiny. And um, so you can see very swank, very beautiful. This was just added just before the fire. Now let's go to the night of November 28, 1942. Uh, a lot of things were going on at that time. First of all, it was the middle of the war, World War, World war II. Um, there was also a very important football game being played that day. Can anyone tell me who was playing? Well, we Boston College. There you go. Very good. Okay, who will, and who was expected to win the game? BC. Yeah, and who won? Well, the uh, you're right. Yeah. Okay, now here's your bonus question. Where was the game played? BC. Fenway Park. It was actually played in Fenway Park. So that was the big news that day in in um, the Boston area. Now, as I said, that the club was actually been inspected just a few days before the fire, so everything looked like it was fine. Um, we talked about this game that BC was expected to win. Unfortunately for them, or fortunately, as we'll see, Holy Cross won. And so the BC crowd, who had expected to win, canceled a party, canceled uh, a trip that they were going to make to the Coconut Grove that night. But everybody else went. There were a number of Holy Cross friends, a few uh, BC people went anyway. And many people packed the club that night. The clubs in those days were for everybody, old and young, rich and poor. It was, it was not like it is now, where you see mostly younger people going to clubs. There were that night, there were wedding parties, anniversary parties, people on dates, soldiers, sailors, girls coming with their their um, best uh, buddies and with their boyfriends. So it was a packed night. Um, a, again, people were trying to escape the war. It was very cold. They're getting ready for the holiday season. So it was a very lively crowd. And it was very crowded in the evening. And they continued to try to pack more and more people into the club that night. There was one special guest at the club. <clears throat> and that was this man, Buck Jones. Buck Jones was a cowboy star, very famous at the time. Uh, in fact, he was an actual cowboy who had been an extra in Hollywood, and then he actually became a star in his own right. And he starred in more than 100 westerns. He was a little bit on the, on the wane at this point in time, in 1942, but he had, had quite a fan club. In fact, if you go online, you can hear the Buck Rogers fan club fighting song, which is quite lively. Um, but he was in Boston because he was promoting uh, war bonds, and he was kind of doing a promotional tour. He was very tired that evening, and he wanted to go home. He had a cold. He didn't want to go out. But people from the movie industry <coughs> convinced him, you've got to go out to the Coconut Grove. This is the place to be. So he put on his boots, and he, like a good, good um, cowboy, he went out to the club that <laughs> night. It was in a table with a number of local um, movie owners and distributors, people who are very much involved with the distri distribution of movies in the Boston area, plus a man named Marty Sheridan, who was his press, who had been acting as kind of his press agent. And they were crammed into the club that night. There's another picture of Buck Jones. So what happened? So you know that the, the, the club is very crowded. <laughs> people kept coming in and the, the waiters kept putting more tables, cramming the people who were trying to dance, more tables, more people coming in. Coats were put on the floor because there was no more room in the coat rack. And there were, I think, we think now, that there were as many as a thousand people in the club that night. And that's in all the different areas I showed you. The club was licensed to have 500 people. So it was way over capacity. What happened was about 10 o'clock, Downstairs in the Melody Lounge, which is that downstairs lounge, kind of, uh, kind of a speakeasy kind of a, a place. 
a busboy lit a match because somebody had unscrewed a light bulb in one of the palm trees down there. And the bartender had seen that and says, no, you can't unscrew the bulb. And he told the busboy, go and put it in. He tried to screw in the bulb. It came out in his hand, so he lit a match, put the bulb back, back, bulb back in. A few minutes later, almost instantaneously, fire was seen in the palm tree, and then it caught the ceiling of the Melody Lounge. Melody Lounge was covered with a cloth ceiling. And so only that was on fire. And so only that fire was spreading. And what was at first kind of funny, hey, look, uh, the, the tree's on fire, became very serious. So people in the Melody Lounge tried to get out. So they ran or started to run up the stairs to get out of the club. Many of them stopped to get their coats. And we think maybe today that's very foolish, but at that time, a coat was a major investment. And it was very important for them to get that coat. So they were trying to get their coats, and they're trying to go out the only exit they knew, which was the main exit with the revolving doors. So they were trying to get out, and meanwhile, the fire was spreading. The fire actually spread up the stairs and into the main dining room. Someone yelled out, fire, fire, and a lot of people thought it was fight, fight. A lot of people stood up to see what's going on. And as they stood up, a huge ball of fire roared through the dining room. And panic. People were panicked, and they were trying to get out. Many were trying to get out through the revolving door. Again, that was the only exit they knew. The revolving door had so many people trying to get out that it jammed. And after a number of people got out, it jammed, and no one else could get out. The fire also spread into that <coughs> other lounge, the Broadway lounge, which, as you know, was not accessible by the public. But somehow the fire reached and found that area. And the problem you have there is that there were two ex there were two doors that exited the Broadway lounge. <coughs> One of the doors on the outside opened outward with the flow of traffic, but the door on the inside opened inward. And what happened in the rush to get out, people pushed that door closed, and people could got, get out there. This is kind of an illustration. It's not exactly totally accurate, but it's a newspaper illustration of how the fire spread. Started in the melee lounge, came up through the main area, and eventually reached the Broadway lounge. Uh, catching people, people could not get out. This was part of the problem of the Coconut Grove. The fire started here. This is actually a picture of the corner where the fire started and spread throughout this complex. This is a picture of the cloth. We think it's a picture of the cloth that was on the uh, coconut, uh, was on the ceiling of the Melody Lounge. We're not quite sure of this. This is in the collection of the Boston Public Library, but it's there for future researchers. This is a look at the stairway. People tried to run up the stairway and get out at the top of the door. Now, one of the problems that the people who were trying to get out of the Melody Lounge was that there was actually, at the top of this stairway, there was a fire exit. There was an exit. Push on the handle, open up, go out. One problem, it was locked, it was bolted. Inside and outside, people just simply could not get out. Firefighters, when they came to the scene, had trouble getting in. So that blocked people there. In the main lounge, people were trying to get out the co get out the main door, the revolving door, which soon jammed up. And then they were trying to get out doors elsewhere in the in the complex. Here's the thing: there was something functionally wrong with almost every exit in this in this area of the in this club. Talked about this was blocked off. This jammed. There used to be a, a door here, but that had been bricked up. There were doors um, behind the stage, but were locked from the inside outside. There was a door here uh, off the main, it was kind of a double door here off the main dining room. It too was locked inside and out. People managed to break it open and get out there, but the problem was fire <coughs> seeks oxygen. So when they managed to break out the door and go out, fire roared out because the fire was seeking oxygen. So it was, it was not um, helpful to the people trying to get out. And then, as I said, there was a problem with the doors leading into the Broadway Lounge. Something was wrong with them. By a strange coincidence, 
firefighters were actually putting out a small fire, an automobile fire nearby. So we were actually on scene very, very quickly. And strangely enough, the fire was controlled very quickly. But it spread so fast, so quickly through the coconut, through the lamp, through the whole building, that's what caused the many deaths and the many injuries. The fire spread incredibly quickly. That's one of the mysteries of this fire. We think, some people say 10 minutes, some people say 15 minutes, for it to spread through the entire complex. The, like I said, the firefighters got there, it was actually extinguished fairly quickly, and then they had to go to the, into the rescue and recovery effort of whoever was left alive, and then the many bodies that were left after the fire went through. People were brought to local hospitals. Um, uh, MGH, of course, but uh, Boston City Hospital at the time got the large lion's share of the patients. In fact, there were patients <coughs> arriving there one every 11 seconds per while. Again, strange coincidence, the staff of the city hospital, they're having a Christmas party. So a lot of doctors and nurses were on, on the scene who would not have been otherwise. So they dropped their party and jumped into action. And started the work of trying to rescue as many people as they could. Some people were marked with M on their foreheads. That meant they were given morphine. Um, the death toll was hard to determine because it, everything was totally chaotic. This is one of the uh, first he headlines uh, of, about the fire. You'll find a name in there, Marty Sheridan. I think I mentioned him. He was with Buck Jones. He actually wasn't, a, wasn't dead. He actually survived. And so, but his wife died in the effort. Um, and um, he survived, and I actually interviewed him years later. But he was actually listed among the dead to start with. Another headline. There was a difficulty in burying all the people. I mean, when, when the, the final death toll initially was about 490 people, a little less. Um, the, you see the death, the official death toll is 492. That's because one of the victims died some months later after the trial, but she died of her injuries. And then there was one uh, young man who was so distraught because he survived the fire, but his wife didn't. He was so distraught over that, so guilt-ridden, he jumped out a window at MGH and he is considered one of the victims because that was the, another thing that came out of this fire was a study of survivor's guilt, post-traumatic shock, <coughs> and the effect of that. People had to go to the morgue to identify their, their loved ones. Buck Jones was brought out alive, but he succumbed to his injuries a few days later. And these are some of the many pictures of the many victims. Page after page in newspapers of names of the dead and injured page after page of their pictures. Uh, I think I talked this. 492, 91 deaths, then another one. About 160, 200 injured. Uh, many were very severely injured. Some needed um, just minor um, treatment, but many were uh, hurt, uh, had to go through years and years of plastic surgery to, to help them. Um, here are some of the pictures of the, of the, of the people who died in the fire. Um, and I mentioned the psychological trauma, and that's another aspect of it. So, so if you can imagine the people who went to the hospital had their burns treated. In fact, there were new techniques for treating burns that were tried out that night on victims of the Coconut Grove. Different ways of dealing with burns which were more systematic treatment. Um, I just was at a conference where they talked in detail about it, so I'm not going to get the medical details of it, but a lot of innovations happened that night in terms of treatment of the burn injuries and then later of the lung injuries as well. Uh, penicillin was used for the first time on a civilian population of, for the victims of fire. A special shipment was brought in. It was used. It was in such low dosage that we're not quite sure if it really had an effect or not. People, but people weren't sure about it. Basically, it didn't kill people. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but if something doesn't kill you, th then up the dosage. So it opened up the whole era of antibiotics, and it began with the coconut growth. And then the psychological uh, effects. So Dr. Lindemann and other people started the whole study 
of people who survive trauma and how trauma, it, it's not a straightforward way of recovery. This is something we now understand. People can be suffering and deal, dealing with, with psychological trouble, trauma long after their physical wounds heal. So these are the, some of the things that came out of, out of this fire. Um, what caused the fire? Now, it seemed very obvious that uh, the busboy did it, but there were a lot of really mysterious things about the fire. One thing I mentioned, the speed. People saw this fireball moving through the club, like, like there was some sort of accelerant, some sort of gasoline, something that made it move. Another thing was that much of the club did not reach what um, the fire community would call flashover. In other words, it didn't reach a temperature where everything burned. Flashover was at the station life club fire. I think you saw how, how hot it was. The whole place burned to the ground. A lot of combustible material was left after the fire in the coconut grove that didn't burn for some reason. People found this very, was kind of unusual, or seemed sort of, sort of mysterious. For example, here so you can see a lot of material that didn't burn. Even some of the palm trees did not burn. They were still standing after the fire. The guilt <coughs> for the fire first settled on the bus boy, Stanley Samachevsky, who was a young man who was um, six, 15 or 16, I forget. He was working, he was supporting his mother, he was supporting his family, and um, he, came, he came forward after some prodding and said, look, I lit, I lit this match. I, I don't know what happened, maybe I did. And so he was considered, that was the prime um, culprit at the beginning. Bus boys match causes fire. That was the beginning. And then doubts began to creep in. How could one match cause all this problem? How could one match, one flame account for this huge fireball that were moved through the through the club? So there's been many, many theories floated over the years of being really what caused it. And some of them are really kind of wild. Um, for example, they felt, people said maybe there's gasoline left over the place and once been a garage, maybe there's a pile of gasoline somewhere. Uh, maybe it was the combustion for the wall furnishings, maybe there's something in that. Maybe there were um, uh, problems from the film, bits of film that were left there. Film is actually quite combustible, so it was a film distribution area, maybe there's some film hanging around there. And then most intriguingly, a lot of people thought it was sabotage. German agents, some sort of terrorism, some sort of, some sort of outside <coughs> force moving in, or maybe another uh, gangster was trying to send a message to, to, to um, Brian Wolanski. Um, so there are many of these theories floated out. More later, about 50 years after the fire, there was a theory floated about something called methyl chloride, which you might have heard of. And the idea was that a refrigerant, refrigerant unit behind the wall in the coconut grove was um, usually used as Freon, but Freon was in, in demand at the war, so they used something called methyl chloride in the refrigerating unit, which <clears throat> ignited and caused that fireball. And it's an interesting theory. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. Um, it's still very mysterious. And what eventually happened is that the fire was determined to be of unknown origin. They did not <coughs> blame the busboy. They did not blame the lighting of the palm tree. They did not, they just said, we just don't know what happened. This angers a lot of people who, who to this day, or to, you know, until they died, said, I saw that boy light the match. I saw the palm tree light on fire. I don't know why they're doing that. But officially, <laughs> the fire is of unknown <coughs> origin. But here's the deal. We don't know how the fire started. But we know what caused the deaths. Kind of an odd thing. The deaths were caused by the unsafe condition of the club. People could not get out. There were not properly lighted exits. The revolving doors jammed. It was, as one of my colleagues called it, a perfect storm of problems in the club. There were not, for example, a lot of broken bones, which you might think people were running over each other, but people were not being trampled to death. They were trying to get away from the intense heat and the terrible smoke, 
trying to get to the exits, if there had been exits that had opened up, the death toll would have been a lot lighter. But they could not get out. So that's what caused the death. And at the trial, the cause of the fire was not we did not become an issue at trial. <coughs> what came up was the condition of the club and how it was maintained by Barney Wolanski, the owner of the club, who was not even at the club that night. He was actually in the hospital. He was sick. Um, so there was a trial, and they, they actually brought um, a case against a number of people, both James and Barney Wolanski and the wine steward, who was apparently trying to stop people from leaving because they hadn't paid their bills. Uh, um, and, but in the end, only Barney Lansk was found guilty of manslaughter. And this was a precedent-setting case. In other words, because he kept a place, the, the Coconut Grove was a place of assembly, it was determined to be a place of assembly, because he kept that in poor condition, he could be liable for the deaths in that, in that place. So he was sentenced to um, time in jail. <coughs> the next slide has, yeah, 12 to 15 years for him in jail. Uh, he was later pardoned by um, the governor at the time, uh, mostly because he was dying, so he went home to die. Um, and basically, and told reporters, he said, I wish I'd died with the others of the fire. And he had just destroyed his life. Um, and again, but his case is used over and over again in other cases in terms of trying to determine if a company can be liable for death or injury on the premises, how they maintain it. So the death toll was horrible, and it's a horrible case, but there was some good that came out of the fire in terms of different innovations. I mentioned the lung and the burn treatments, the lung treatments. There were many things that were discovered about that. The legal precedents, and most importantly, safety rule enforcements. People, before the coconut grove, people did know that revolving doors were pretty dangerous. And they did know that if you sprinkled something, a building, it would probably make it safer. And they did know that you should have lighted exits and clearly marked exits. But there was no political will to enforce some of those rules. And this is what we see over and over again. The rules were on the books. They were there, but they weren't being enforced. <coughs> so what the Coconut Grove did was <coughs> encourage people to, in some cases, pass laws, but encourage others to enforce those rules enforce those occupancy rules. To this day, people who inspect clubs are very aware of those occupancy rules. And they will stop people from going in the club if it's over with. They can really anger a lot of young people wanting in the club. <coughs> and they just say, we're not going to overcrowd you. That, that's an important aspect of it. So the, the Coconut Grove gave people, the sort of politicians, the political will and the impetus to put things into, a, into writing and then to enforce them. We see this all the time, right? We see this all the time. When something happens, there's a, there's a push to make changes. Um, but unfortunately, we have to repeat this over and over again about safety rules, zoning, protection. The warehouse fire in, um, the ghost, ghost ship uh, warehouse fire in California, ridden with problems. And it seemed fun and funky at the time, but something goes wrong and people can't get out. So it is something that's worth repeating about the coconut grove. Now, um, we're still learning about this fire. I, I want to I just kind of um, go into just a little bit more about why this is an abiding um, story that is fascinating. When I first started reaching the coconut grove, and I started researching as part of my, part of my book, Boston on Fire. And then I later wrote a book specifically just about the Coconut Grove. And a firefighter named Charles Kenny, whose father was a firefighter at the Coconut Grove, and who suffered um, injuries so bad at the Coconut Grove that he had to quit being a firefighter. His son, Charles Kenny, was also a firefighter until he suffered an injury at the fire, and he went into another field. His son, another Charles Kenny, was an editor, uh, a, an editor over at the Boston Globe, and another son of his, John Kenny, was actually with FEMA, and he was one of the people who went to the World Trade Center for years. <coughs> so Charles Kenny was very much involved with uh, firefighting and, and other things. And he said to me, <coughs> beware of getting involved, get, go looking into the story. It's a never-ending story. It will continue to haunt you, and it has. It keeps me interested. 
one of the things we keep finding out is that victims come forward, there's stories that come out. So we hear stories and we realize the trauma 75 years ago still continues, it still carries on, and the mysteries. I talked about what caused the fire, we still don't know. Uh, but I did a, a, a presentation with someone from um, a, a local college that is used teaching his students, they're, they're firefighters, so engineering students, and they're modeling this fire. They're going to see if they can come up with any answers and figure out now with computer programming and modeling, maybe we can figure out just what happened, what were the conditions that caused it. So people are still looking at it. The other thing is, and this is a more recent thing, is that a number of people involved with the fire afterwards were threatened by somebody. Someone would call them up and tell them to lay off the investigation of the coconut grove. Stay away. If you know what's good for you, lay off of it. A reporter, a lawyer, an investigator, um, and then other people were threatened. We don't know who they are, who these people were, or what their problem was, or why they went to the trouble of threatening people. It's still a mystery. And one of the lawyers who I interviewed when he was 90 years old, he still, he, I asked him if he knew who was threatening him, and he said he did. He said, I said, will you tell me? He said, no. Why not? I said, I think they're dead by now. And he said, no, but their children might come after me. I want to live. I want my children to live. He still wouldn't tell me. Many of the investigators, one of the investigators burned his notes from the fire afterwards. He got rid of them all. So there was something else about this fire that really bothered people, and we're still trying to figure out what it is. But there are other little things that keep happening. For example, in, in uh, 2013, at the side of the Coconut Grove, they created a new road called the Coconut Grove Lane. It was due to the work of a gentleman named Ken Marshall, who has been very active in promoting a memorial, a more substantive memorial for the Coconut Grove. And he is one of many people very interested in keeping the story of this alive. These are some pictures from the um, dedication of the Coconut Grove Lane in 2013, there's the mayor there, former uh, police commissioner Paul Christian. Um, these are two survivors from the fire, and then these uh, are the they are descendants of a young boy, a Tony Mara, who was a busboy in the time of the fire, and he managed to escape because well, first he tried to get into a locked refrigerator. There's a big refrigerating unit, and many people from the fire jumped in there, closed the door, and they managed to survive. And he was trying to get in, and they wouldn't let him in. Because they said, there's no room, you have to go away. So he stuck his head into a small refrigerator unit with ice cream in it and um, managed to survive the, the fire. And when he got out, there was like ice cream dripping down his, his hair. And he told that story many times. He also um, created a plaque at the site of the Coconut Grove, which put up for the 50th more. I'm going to talk about that plaque in a minute. But this is something that happened more recently. <coughs> now, uh, here's a picture of how the... It's now called, everyone, everyone can see that coconut grove lake. All right. Now, other things keep happening. Uh, this gentleman um, popped up at one of my, one of my readings uh, a long time ago. I'll just see if I can play this. But he is, he's, I, I, he started talking, and I whipped out my phone. I was trying to take pictures of him. Um, but he is a relative of Stanley Tomachevsky, who was the busboy. And the busboy suffered the rest of his life from people accusing him of being, of setting the match, of causing all this. And this was one of his relatives that just jumped up and started talking. So let me see if I can play this and see if I can hear it. If not, like Lighting the fire. Stanley was a hard worker. His father was unemployed. He was trying to help his mother out. Saturday morning, he would get the wagon. He'd go out selling fruit and vegetables. At night, he went to the coconut grove, making himself a few bucks for his mother. He ended up being a captain in the army. Had a very successful life. Being a... Uh, they handle all kinds of books for big companies, and I visited him so many times, and he just was so felt so bad that he could blame, and people were spitting on him and calling him at all hours of the morning to blast him out, being the culprit. 
and it wasn't so. Uh, I'm only 89, and I'm still enjoying my life, and it's so nice to speak my piece here. God love you, Stanley. This was a woman who got up at one of my talks and read something from her uh, father's diary, which is all about BC and the game, and uh, how the first entry is, oh, BC lost this football game. It's really awful. It's the most terrible thing that could have happened. And the next entry was all about the Coconut Grove, saying, well, guess what? It wasn't so bad. In fact, for BC's sake, it was probably a miracle because they didn't go to the Coconut Grove last night. So that just is someone that appeared uh, at one of my things. Um, this is uh, a woman who came to one of my events. She showed me a diamond watch that she was found at her aunt, who died in the Coconut Grove, and has been handed down in the family. So I thought that was interesting. <coughs> um, these are some, uh, these gentlemen here can't see them, but they, their uncle <coughs> worked at the Coconut Grove, and he, had, he escaped the fire, and he had drink tickets from that night in his pocket. Mm -hmm. And these, this material has been uh, donated to the, uh, the National Fire Protection Association for safekeeping, but these are artifacts from the fire that night. Uh, which they brought to my attention. Um, this is a gentleman, he brought in the remnants of his father's, excuse me, his uncle who died in the fire. This was his wallet that they retrieved and this was everything that was in his wallet. There was a dollar in the wallet. So interesting, these are some interesting artifacts about it. Um, I, I had the opportunity to interview uh, another survivor. This was a horrible story in which um, a young woman uh, and her boyfriend were at the club with her parents, his parents. Um, they were celebrating, um, and, uh, and of that party, only two survived, the mother of one of the boys and Ann Clark. She lost both her parents and her boyfriend in that. Um, but she managed to survive and went on, had a, had a very long and very productive and very lovely life. It's a picture of her with her parents. Uh, she recently died, but she lived well into her 90s and she managed to survive that night, despite physical and mental trauma. Um, there are more and more material that's being put up online about the Coconut Fire. These are transcripts from the police that are put up, um, which people have been looking over for clues and different things. Um, there is something called um, the Coconut Grove Coalition that has put together this website that's all sorts of material, like if you wanted to find, if anyone from Holliston, for example, was a victim of the fire, you can go here and you can find a, a victim's list and you can go through that and look and for your hometowns. Because uh, Coconut, uh, it doesn't show the website, uh, I think it's Coconut Grove Fire, I'll, I'll give it to you afterwards, but it's, it's on, it's, it's a really great resource online. Um, this, is, this is another look at it, does it have the website? Yeah, there it is, coconutgrovefire.org, but it has all this material. So there's a lot more material that's going on here. Um, here's another very interesting artifact that was in the collection of Charles Kenny, who I mentioned. Uh, it's in the Boston Public Library. It is the ledger from the Coconut Grove, um, and it lists all the payments to all the people who worked there. This is the page from the last night. It shows what people were paid. And what's really interesting about this ledger is that it is actually kept by a very interesting woman. Now, um, you know... Ponzi, Charles Ponzi. Everybody know who Charles Ponzi is? Yeah, the Ponzi yeah. screams. Well, after he was put away, his wife, Rose Gecko Ponzi, had to make a living, and she was the bookkeeper. That's her here. She was the bookkeeper for the Coconut Grove. So that was, the ledger was in her handwriting, and she kept it for the, for the club. Probably because no one else would hire her, but Wolanski was able to do that. A um, couple things. This was the site of the Coconut Grove. In 2000, I just happened to take these pictures in 2010. And this is what it looked like for a long time. It was basically a parking lot. And there was a plaque in the sidewalk made by T Tony Mara. And um, it was to mark the approximate sites of the revolving doors. And so that's a look at it there. And then a look of the plaque itself. That's what the plaque looked like. And this is looking at the site. <laughs> that way, that building, um, that's where the Broadway Lounge was, so the, the Coconut Grove actually extended from this street all the way to the other end, to Broadway. But it's all been broken up and changed around now. And then 
And for many years, there was a lot of things. What do we do with the site? How can we memorialize it? What can we do with it? Well, Boston being Boston, the forces development move in, and right now, this is what it is. It's luxury condos. And um, there's some, so the, they, probably, they finally sold it, finally put up, uh, these are like $2 million condos, in this, and they put them in this area, right on the spot where the Coconut Grove was. And they did not want, there was a big contract, they did not yeah. want the plaque in front of their luxury condos because they didn't want to be reminded of what happened. So the plaque was eventually moved to the, down a little bit. It's not that bad because it's near the Coconut Grove sign, but it used to be over farther back where the, where the uh, revolving doors were. Now it's over here. Fortunately, it is in the area. They didn't get rid of it, but, but um, there is a group, a committee that is looking around and trying to think of how can we better memorialize uh, this tragedy which has had so much effect on so many people in Boston. It really needs something that remembers the victim but also is a teaching tool. It's also a way to helping us look forward. And this group of people, for example, just recently organized a commemoration again, it's cut off of the 75th anniversary. I went to the talk and they had, they had amazing presentations there from people on the medical issues on the uh, if police enforcement issues, on um, uh, the effect on safety um, protocols. And uh, it was just a really, it was a really great um, presentation. And it was at the Revere Hotel, so it was right near the site of the Coconut Grove. But this, this group, and Ken Marshall's been putting it together, is doing this great job of keeping, keeping the memories alive, keeping um, people going. And there's a lot more people doing research. Like, there's a number of people who are researching the the actions of the nurses in the coconut uh, at, after the coconut grove. There's other people who are looking at some of the aspects of it. So it's still it's still something that is of interest to amateur historians, to scholars, and to many other people. Um, one thing I'll notice this is this is the most exciting thing that's happening that there is a, a documentary is finally being produced on the coconut grove. Uh, it's called Six Locked Doors: The Legacy of the Coconut Grove. And um, it's being done by this guy, Zachary Graves Miller. Uh, I've been, I, he's interviewed, interviewed me for it. I've kind of given him the materials. He's working on extremely hard. Um, uh, he's got, I think he's still raising money for it. So if anybody knows, has any, someone who's looking for a worthy cause to donate, you know, a couple extra hundred thousand. Um, <laughs> but it would be really nice to get this done because he is working on it. And I think he's doing a great job. And many of the people who, um, who, who were, losing, were losing survivors every day. So he interviewed a number of people who have since passed on. He did interview um, Marshall Cole, who I, just, who I just showed you his picture. He has a very good interview with him. And he's interviewed a lot of other people. So it's, it's not only that this documentary will be produced, but then there's archival film. There's material that can be put together. Because again, there's still material we just don't know about this, this fire. And we also want to keep exploring the ramifications to see what we can do about it. So I think that's a very exciting development that's, that's happening on this. So I'll just end up by saying that, that every time I go to one of these events, people in the room have their stories of the Coconut Grove. And it's good to keep remembering them because this was a fire that it didn't just affect the victims and the injured. It had a ripple effect on people, families, on people in the medical professions, on people in the the fire uh, safeties and the first responders, um, all kinds of peripheral people had an impact from this fire. So it's something that's a very vital part of Boston history, and we need to keep remembering it, not just because we need to look backwards, but we also need to look forwards and then think of how the lessons of this fire can be applied to building in the future to other nightclubs and to other places where people gather. Thank you so much for coming.